Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to our lecture this evening. Um, I would like to welcome Jessica Crawford, our Southeastern Regional Director, to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Jessica. Thank you. I'm honored to be able to introduce to you my friend, Dr. Ashley Dumas, who is going to talk to you tonight about the research she's been conducting at Fort, Fort Tom Beckby on the Tom Beckby River in Alabama. The Conservancy purchased part of the site jointly with the University of West Alabama, and over the course of several years, we're turning over our ownership in the site to the university. I found out that we were going to be able to acquire some of uh, Fort Tom Beckby when kind of spur of the moment, Ashley called me one day and asked if we could come up with some money fast enough to be at a courthouse auction in a few days, and somehow we did, and it was my first and only uh, time to acquire part of a site at a courthouse auction. Um, Ashley received her BA in anthropology and French from the University of South Alabama, and she got her MA and her PhD from the University of Alabama. One of her most interesting projects to me was when she conducted excavations on Avery Island in South Louisiana at the original Tabasco hot sauce plant. But I thought that I always thought that was really cool. Um, her dissertation was about the production and use of salt by late prehistoric people in Southwest Alabama. And she's been at the University of West Alabama since 2009, where her projects include her work at Fort Tom Beckby, uh, also documenting slave dwellings and locating Mobile at the site of the 1540 battle between DeSoto and Chief Tuscaloosa. Mm -hmm. And so I, I appreciate Ashley uh, agreeing to do this lecture for us from from her home kind of out in the country where she has a satellite <laughs> internet connections. And as I know, because I have one at my house also, so it might, things might kind of slow down a little bit every now and then, but just, just be patient and hang in there with us. Ashley also is recovering from, from COVID. So she's really, she's really doing us a favor tonight. And thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you, Jessica. I am, um, really excited to be talking about Fort Tom Beckby with the Conservancy members because um, you all have played such an important part of um, preserving this really important site. And it's about time that um, I spoke to you about it. So um, I'm gonna take a moment here and share my screen so that you can see the presentation. Okay. Um, let's see. There we go. That look good. Looks great. Okay. Okay. So, um, the title of my presentation is this distant and isolated post, the role of Fort Tom Beckby in La Louisiane, 1736 to 1763. Um, in a way, this this title is ironic and perhaps a bit misleading, but I will fill you in on why that is so toward the end of the presentation. I'm going to begin this evening by um, giving you some historical background about Fort Tom Beckby. I will then cover some archeology span and then we'll talk about some of the artifacts that have been found there and what they tell us about um, French um, um, interactions and about the um, relationship that they had with the Choctaw Indians. So here we, um, we see a, an image of 18th century geopolitical landscapes in the uh, eastern half of North America. And um, along the Atlantic coast, you have the British colonies but taking up most of the um, eastern part of the continent is this blue area, which is New France. And um, it's a massive piece of territory running all the way from um, upper um, Quebec down to the Gulf of Mexico, from the Appalachian Mountains in the east, across the Mississippi River, and onto the edge of the Great Plains to the west. So it's a huge piece of territory. Um, the lifeline um, or the, the artery for the French in this territory was certainly the Mississippi River, and it was um, extremely strategic to them. Uh, the British and the French were at odds, as they usually um, were in this century, and we'll talk about how that played out in a moment. 
I want to point out that while the British territory here is geographically small, the colonies had 1.25 million people and they were um, not just colonists, they felt, you know, as, as we all know, like Americans, um, they were living in large cities, they were forming their own local um, uh, political organizations, and about every 25 years, their population doubled. In contrast, if you look across that entire blue area of New France, there were um, maybe around 100,000 people and there were only 60,000 in La Louisiane, which is the lower portion of the lower Mississippi uh, River Valley. New Orleans in 1750, um, for instance, had fewer than 1,000 people. So it's a vast territory with very few people. Um, most of them, uh, most of them um, clustered into small forts um, on the frontier. The major event um, marking this period was the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War that uh, lasted from 1756 to 1763. And what I'd like to point out here is that um, much of the, the action in the war was happening in Quebec. It was happening in New England in the northeastern part of the colonies. Very little um, was happening apart from some some maneuvering um, down in La Louisiane. And you'll notice here that Fort Tom Beckby, located in present day West Alabama, is in this hatchard area. It was in a disputed territory, and the territory was always um, and had been disputed between the British and the French. The Spanish in um, uh, La Florida were also um, vying for more territory in this region. So everything happening in La Louisiane was very much contested. And it's in this environment um, on this uh, a build up to this, um, to this war that Fort Tom Beckby was founded. Before the war, um, the troops de la Marine, who were the primary colonial um, military force um, in North America, were the only regular soldiers there. And Tom Beckby never really played a major role in the French and Indians War. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, why had it been constructed at all? Well, the 1733 map by Baron de Crenet um, is, a, is it really a demonstration of, or a, an indication of French priorities in the Gulf South in the early 18th century. Um, on this map are some of the small French forts. There are some small towns such as Mobile, uh, Spanish Pensacola, um, New Orleans is indicated here. But the primary um, uh, images on the map, the, what the map maker was especially um, interested in depicting here were the locations of indigenous peoples. And the locations of the transportation routes that linked the indigenous peoples together. And a great deal of effort was put into naming these peoples and in indicating by little red symbols there indicating a house exactly how many warriors were present in each one of those um, areas. Um, Native alliances and the deerskin trade were extremely important to the French. The low population they had, the uh, low support that they had from the French crown at the time meant that they were extraordinarily reliant on these people um, for, um, for allies, for trading partners, for buffers and protection against the British. If you look at the top of the map, you'll see the red circle. And there within the red circle, it says Pays de Chickasaw. And this is the Chickasaw country or a country of territory of the Chickasaw. The Chickasaw and the Choctaw had been long time enemies. And so it's no surprise that the Chickasaw were allied with the British. The Choctaws were allied with the French, um, uh, ethnic Choctaw peoples, um, um, lived from the uh, center of their territory here all the way to the Gulf South. The French had established Fort Toulouse in 1717 among the Muscogee uh, or Creek peoples. 
um, to secure trade there. And they actually had um, settlers there, um, family, French families who were, who were there. Fort Rosalie was established in 1716 on the Mississippi River among the Natchez. And there too, there were French plantations, um, enslaved Africans working those plantations, settlements, uh, and um, you know, uh, sort of successful um, enterprises in the colonial effort. All of this changed um, in 1729 um, through a, a series of events and, and really ugly management, um, ugly behavior, as we would say, um, by, by the French toward their Natchez allies. The Natchez decided in 1729 they wouldn't take it any longer. They rebelled, um, they massacred um, as many French uh, men as they could. They kidnapped um, many women and children, and then they fled uh, to the Chickasaw, uh, whom they knew would take them in um, as, as uh, enemies of the French. At the time, the governor of La Louisiane was uh, Sieur de Bienville. Bienville was a fascinating figure. He um, had been part of the first French exploration of the Gulf in 1699 as a, an older teenager. He was accompanying his brother, Iberville, who was in charge of that ex, uh, ex, exploratory adventure. And Bienville was the one who Iberville would say, well, this, this river inlet looks interesting. Um, Bienville, take a canoe and um, a couple of guys with you. Uh, head up there, explore. We'll see you in a couple weeks down the coast. Um, so uh, Bienville was a remarkable person. He did these things um, and he learned native languages. He was purported to be tattooed from the neck to the waist um, by, with Indian tattoos. Um, he was generally well respected among Indians, but he was um, a European and he had uh, very specific goals. He needed to show the Natchez and the Choctaw and the Chickasaws and the Muscogee that the French were not going to stand for the type of massacre that had occurred at Fort Rosalie. He needed to flex French strength and to retaliate against the Natchez and the Chickasaw for protecting uh, the Natchez. And he needed to protect French control of the Mississippi River. The Chickasaws were gathering on the bluffs at present day Memphis and they would often attack French uh, boats and traders going up and down the river. So this was a real threat to uh, control of the, of the interior of North America. Uh, Bienville launched um, a series of attacks known as the Chickasaw Campaigns, one in 1736, which is relevant to this story, and one in 1739. I'll just tell you here that both of them were failures. Um, they, did not, um, they did not succeed. Um, one strategy that did work among both the British and the French, and, and I know that previous scholars have said that the British were the only ones who did this, but the French were also adept at inciting violence between different indigenous ethnicities. And Bienville had been doing this um, for several decades. Since the 1720s, he had been inciting the Choctaw to uh, raid Chickasaw towns and um, to kill British traders who were going in to uh, work with the Chickasaw. The first um, plan to retaliate was to rendezvous with an army from the Illinois country, uh, up the, the head of the Mississippi River, led by a man named Pierre d'Artaguet. Uh, D'Artaguet uh, rallied some Illini uh, native warriors and they traveled south uh, down the Mississippi and then overland and found themselves outside of the Chickasaw uh, homeland. But Bienville wasn't there. Bienville was supposed to come up the river from Mobile, the capital of La Louisiane at the time, and to um, meet D'Artaguet. They were to combine forces and then attack the Chickasaws. What D'Artaguet didn't know is that Bienville had been delayed by spring rains and he was unable to move upstream. By the time he got word, he and his men were running out of food and supplies. It was either attack 
or go home uh, on, a, on, a, on a wasted journey. They decided to attack. It was disastrous. They found the Chickasaws and the Natchez well armed with British uh, guns, um, well organized in their uh, repulse of the French, and Dartiget himself was killed. So Bienville finally makes it up the river and he stops at a high chalk bluff on what is today the Tom Bigby River, just outside of the Choctaw Indian homeland. And it's here where he rendezvous with 600 Choctaw warriors. Um, the 600 Choctaw warriors, the 600 French Marines, and a company of 45 free Africans led by a man named Simon um, move up the river and they, uh, the short version is, is that they too are repulsed by, um, by the well-armed Chickasaws. And so they limp back down the river to the White Bluff where Bienville declares that, um, oh, here's a slide showing you um, that here's the French fort that's been destroyed. Here's um, Fort Tom Beckby just outside of the Chickasaw, uh, the, excuse me, the Choctaw homeland. And this is a wonderful map that we have of that battle um, between Bienville's forces and the Chickasaw and Natchez. And this is the Battle of Akia. It's in present day, probably Southern uh, Tupelo, Mississippi. Um, Bienville orders that a fort be built and that this fort sh should be garrisoned by around 40 Marines. Uh, and the purpose was to um, maintain this spot as a listening post for activity uh, from the British who were constantly trying to make inroads with the Choctaws and lure them away from the French. They wanted to use it as a trading center with the Choctaws and also as a sign of French commitment to the Alliance. And um, leading from the main gate of the fort here is a path and this well-worn path leads out to the Western part of the, of the um, of the territory. And here in French, it says Chemin des Choctaws, uh, which means uh, road to the Choctaws or road of the Choctaws. So right there in the official engineer's drawing of the completed Fort Tom Beckby in March of 1737, we see on the map the importance of that link, literal link to the Choctaw Nation. The French remained in um, um, on this bluff uh, until 1763, which was the end of the Seven Years' War, when um, all French possessions save uh, New Orleans were turned over to the British at, in the Treaty of Paris. Um, the British occupied the fort briefly um, from 1763 to 1768. But native peoples were no fools. They were not going to um, stick up for the losers. And so with the British holding all the territory here, um, it really wasn't a strategic location. And um, they renamed it Fort York. The name really never stuck. It continued to be called Fort Tom Beckby. Um, by 1772, we know that um, surveyor Bernard Romans, British surveyor Bernard Romans, comes down the Tom Bigby River in a boat and he looks up at the bluffs uh, and he notes that there are the remains of old French Fort Tom Beckby, the old French fort. So by 1772, there's very little left on this spot. And after that, the site is basically abandoned until 1794 when um, the, the Spanish in Florida are attempting to push uh, the limits of their territory as far north as they can. Of course, by 1794, the Spanish are fighting not with the French or the British, but they're dealing with the Americans in the, in the new, newly formed United States. That's another story that I'll save um, for a time. But what I do want to point out here in this image is that the fort structure and the buildings, the layout remain basically unchanged from the French through the uh, British occupation. When the Spanish came through, they reconfigured the fort entirely and used the landscape entirely differently. They did not use um, the ravine as part of their defensive works. They built a huge earthen um, 
a huge earthen berm and on top of that was another palisade because the French and English with their wooden palisade were defending against muskets, perhaps bows and arrows. The Spanish were expecting to be defending themselves against American artillery. So you have two very different forts at this spot and that's significant for archeology span because when the Spanish built this, um, this crown shaped fort, they basically destroyed a lot of the earlier remains, um, a lot of the, the French and English remains. So that's become one of the challenges for doing archeology span at this site. So um, my interest has been in those earlier, that earlier period. Um, what of those 27 years of French occupation and interaction with the Choctaws? The Choctaw homeland is, um, is here. Um, it uh, more or less stops at the Tom Bigby River on which the fort sits. And the center of their um, villages um, is only about 30 miles to the west. Um, they are comprised of three different political groups, the west, the south, also known as the six towns, and the east. The southern organization um, were largely politically independent of what was happening um, with the western and the eastern divisions of the Choctaws. Um, each one of these divisions had their own principal chief. Um, now, we know that the Choctaws of the eastern division established a village within musket shot of Fort Tom Beckby shortly after the fort was built. Um, and that is important to, the, to understanding the interactions here. Between 1747 and 1750, um, war broke out between the Western and the Eastern divisions of the Choctaws. There were disputes over which European force um, they should ally with. The Western division was leaning toward the British and the one of the, the war chief of the Western division known as Red Shoes was extraordinarily um, unimpressed with French efforts. Um, the French had higher prices, they had fewer goods and were always short. And so Red Shoes actually led an expedition to Charleston to the main British training post, the center of, of, um, of enterprise. He led an expedition there himself um, to, you know, um, not only establish a relationship with the British, but to seriously thumb his nose, so to speak, at the French. Um, the, the, the Choctaw Civil War was devastating for um, the Choctaws. There was a tremendous amount of bloodshed. Um, and the French were paying the Eastern Division three times the usual price for scalps taken from anyone from the Western Division. At the time, Fort Tom Beckby was used as a base from which French troops were sent uh, to aid the Eastern Division. And it eventually served as a location where the treaty ending the Choctaw Civil War was signed. Um, so it remained an important uh, place for that sort of military action and diplomatic action to occur. So this is the documentary part of the Fort Tom Beckery story. We have, um, we have uh, hundreds of letters written to people at Fort Tom Beckby, written uh, from commandants at Fort Tom Beckby. We have maps, we have other military records, and these are the documents of the elite and of the literate. They don't tell the whole story. So what does the archeology span have to say about this important site? The first archeology span was in 1980 and it largely focused on the Spanish Fort. What you're seeing here is the 1737, a map of French Fort Tom Beckby overlaid with a topographic map of the crown shaped Fort Confederation or the Spanish Fort right here. And all of the little gray um, squares, these were excavation units. These were test units put in by the archeologists from the Alabama Historical Commission in 1980. You'll notice that most of these units are within the uh, boundaries of the Spanish Fort. 
Some of them were into the, um, the earthworks themselves. But what they're working with here is a jumble of material and they did a good job of sorting it out. Um, what my team wanted to do was to locate undisturbed earlier components of the fork. And if you look at this overlay, you'll notice up here um, in this corner, there's a portion of this bastion which was unimpacted by the Spanish fort. And apart from this modern erosional gully, you also have this portion of the fort that was not uh, seriously impacted by the later construction. So this is where we've centered our, our archeology. span In 2010, I dug here um, for the first time um, with students from the University of West Alabama. And this is what we found, this <laughs> dark, um, linear um, uh, line, this feature, right? This is archaeology gold. It's not the it's not the artifact. Sometimes it's just stains in the dirt, as many of you probably know. Um, we wanted to find French deposits, and when we first saw this, we thought, "Great, it's a sewer trench." Um, there was a campground at the fort in the 1960s and 1970s, and we thought for sure that we had located um, what appears to be a very modern, a very um, well-defined uh, historic trench. Well, we began following that trench and expanding the units and expanding the units and expanding the units, and eventually we located a bend, and here's the bend that bend corresponds perfectly with the location and the size and the angle degree of the Southwest Bastion of Fort Tom Beckley. This was the big discovery. Um, this is the corner of the Southwest Bastion of the fort. What this does is a, it allowed us to first test the accuracy of that 1737 map of the fort. It turns out it's very accurate, no surprise, having been um, drawn by an engineer. The second thing it, it allowed us to do is to use that map to extrapolate where all of the other structures might be in the fort. So it, you know, locating this um, corner in the first season of work was extremely serendipitous and it's been extremely beneficial to us, allowing us to really target our excavations where we, where we want to be. Since 2010, um, we've worked at um, we've worked on that palisade. Here are our excavation units placed on and around the palisade. From there, we were able to come right down on top of the um, French bakery, which may be one of the um, only French uh, bakeries um, excavated, certainly in uh, La Louisiane. Um, and hey, it's a French site, gotta have, a, gotta have French bread, right? Um, and we've also worked at the barracks um, itself. I'll get to that in a minute. This is a picture of what that palisade wall looks like when excavated. We, we found um, uh, uh, a trench where the post had been set for the wall. Um, there are two rows of posts um, parallel to one another, um, one here and one here. And that indicates to us that there were repairs happening to the four. The original wall is likely the one on the outside, and then the newer wall is the one on the inside. And you can see it's an extremely well-defined feature. The chalk is um, the uh, chalk bedrock is the um, is the uh, uh, subsurface here. So um, it uh, it holds water. Um, it also preserves bone well, and it preserves features um, extremely well. And some of these um, trenches that we excavated, you could actually see the pick marks left um, in, the, in the chalk um, by the excavators. And you could tell which way, based on the angle of the pick marks, which way the excavators were standing and working to dig out that chalk. So this is what the feature looked like. And that nice dark brown soil was absolutely full of artifacts. After the fort decayed and the posts were pulled or reused or fell over, artifacts from behind the bakery washed down the little slope and filled up the builder's trench for that, for that palisade wall. And that became a source of um, excellent information for us. Artifacts include obviously um, European pottery and Choctaw pottery. 
Um, we have um, a lot of this beautiful tin glaze material. This is a, um, a clasp knife blade um, before conservation that was pulled from that context. At the bakery itself, we um, were able to isolate French uh, from English features. So here on the left, this is, um, this is a, a set of chalk blocks cut from the bedrock and they're put, they're placed underneath the front portion of the structure. We know that the British rebuilt that structure and here we have evidence of that because they're laying on top of an area of uh, hearth clean out or oven clean out. It's full of ash and um, interestingly full of lead shot. We think the, um, um, the French must have been melting lead in their kitchen um, and dropping it to make a uh, drop shot for ammunition. Our excavation units at the barracks um, cut across the barracks, so we wanted to get a picture of what was on the um, on the visible side, the side of the barracks that faced the parade ground and would have been visible to anyone on duty and to commanding officers, and get a picture of what might be underneath the barracks, which were on raised piers, and then also what was behind the barracks, what's going on back here, um, out of sight from from um, officers' eyes. Um, we're also, you know, we're hoping to learn a little bit about the average French Marine's life, and particularly if Choctaw artifacts um, made it into the fort and made it into use there um, by the, by the um, French. You have, you know, you're in the middle of the Choctaw homeland. There's a village that's been established nearby for trading. Um, this is a remote outpost. It was considered a hardship tour. Um, the documents tell us that there were um, there were periods of hunger. There were a couple of mutinies. There were desertions. So this was not a happy place. Um, what role might the Choctaw have played in, um, you know, contributing to that hardship or um, um, aiding uh, that hard or um, helping with that hardship? In this area, we discover some fantastic stratigraphy. Um, that helped us isolate all of the time periods. I use this, um, I use this slide a lot to, to teach my classes and show them how every archeological site is like a unique history book. And each one of those layers is a chapter in the history book. Um, unlike a history book, we just read an archeological site backwards. So here's the modern level. These, this is a, uh, a broken chalk cap that the Spanish put over their earthworks. This um, reddish layer here um, dates from the English period and is probably from a period of burning uh, barracks post, um, post British abandonment. And then the original French and English deposits um, are on the bottom and, and continue down. So this was very important for us in understanding the history of the site. Everything that we screen at Fort Tom Beckby, except for things with big uh, pieces of chalk in them, is screened through 16th inch mesh. Um, what that means is window screen. We put everything through window screen. Um, that's not fun. <laughs> I've probably lost a few students from the profession um, by keeping this rule. But the important thing is that we're catching little things that would normally be lost, things like brass pens. Um, things like um, tiny little uh, clips, uh, the metal clips that went on uniforms, glass beads, and hundreds of thousands of animal bone fragments. Um, and we, we intend to continue using this method um, as we go. We're learning a lot about mid 18th century life at a frontier outpost. And we're learning that because this site has never been plowed, um, the preservation is really excellent. We find things, uh, you know, like larger pieces of ceramics, this um, beautiful tin glaze plate uh, platter. Um, this is a sort of an odd object, but if you look closely, you can see the um, linear indentations, parallel linear indentations, like you might find on a rough hewn piece of wood. And what this is, um, is a dirt dauber's nest that was attached to the structure, to the barracks. It was fire hardened and then preserved in the ground. And we find quite a few of these fire hardened dirt dauber's nests in the area of the barracks. 
In the upper layers, we've actually found these uh, uh, cloth pieces. This is a finely woven um, linen, and it is possibly the fingertip of a glove. Um, it's been preserved by um, uh, copper brass salts that were, that were near it, but that was very near the surface. So we have excellent preservation of the site. Um, the ever, um, you know, we have things like, um, you know, um, obvious signs of military occupation, um, um, brass uniform buttons, gun flints, buckles, musket balls, um, a lot of French um, pottery, things from the Saint-Ange region of Western France, um, pieces of um, Dutch tin glaze, some uh, refined earthenware also from France, things that are typical in these colonial French sites. And then you, you find the occasional odd thing like this, which is um, it's a, an oolitic limestone that is not local to the area. It's a ground object. Um, it's probably um, a uh, celt of some sort, appears to be of native origin, and it was underneath the barracks. Um, so that's the kind of thing that makes you wonder um, what's going on. Is this a souvenir um, picked up by, um, by a, you know, a French Marine? Um, was it traded in? Was it a gift? Um, we, we don't know. So what I've, what I've done here is in this slide, I've assembled objects that are both European and indigenous manufacture each having something to say about the relationship between the French and the Choctaws at Fort Tom Beckby. So I'm gonna take them one by one and use them to sort of um, frame or characterize what was happening at this place. First, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, um, a bead. It's a shell bead made from the communella of a shell, the center part of a shell. Um, making shell beads um, is an ancient uh, tradition among North American, um, Eastern North American Indians. It goes back thousands and thousands of years. Um, it was still being done here in the 18th century, clearly. Um, in this quote at the bottom of this slide in Choctaw, it says, uh, quote, that one bead um, was worth a horse, one necklace, one shell necklace was worth a horse. I don't know about that, um, perhaps. Um, um, another um, um, ethno-historic reference to shell beads is by James Adair, who said that among the Choctaws and Chickasaws, one bead the length of a finger was worth four buckskins. And that sounds about right. The French, quantified and commodified native made beads in order to control the market. And this particular bead, interestingly, was found in the bakery. It was not in the barracks. Um, it wasn't in some backfill. It was found specifically in, um, in, a, in a work area that required some specialized knowledge and specialized work. I think that it was probably worn by a Frenchman who had um, traded for it. Um, but what we know is that after the French attempted to control the market in these types of native made beads, they then flooded the market with their own, with, with glass beads. Um, and it was in the 18th century that we saw the effective end of widespread bead making among native peoples, particularly out of columella um, from shells, from gastropods like this. Um, those glass beads, um, of which we don't find many in the fort, um, are interesting. I've worked at other French colonial sites in the Southeast. And one of the most common objects on those sites are glass beads. 
we found probably a total of 125 over all of the excavations at Fort Tom Beckby over the years. Certainly, um, glass beads would be found um, in, uh, at Choctaw households themselves where they were being traded to. But we do find the glass beads in all contexts at Fort Tom Beckby, in all places, um, from the Palisade Trench to the bakery to the barracks. And we know that the beads were worn by both the Choctaws, as you can see in this 1830 depiction, here's a beaded sash. And this is um, a, a beaded skirt here on, um, the ball, on the ball player. And the beads were worn by the French. The, the French um, living in um, humid uh, West Alabama and other parts of the Southeast, probably didn't stick to their woolen uh, uniforms strictly uh, year round. And we began to see some of them uh, wear beaded moccasins, deerskin leggings, often adorned with ribbons and beads. The beads are a symbol of um, a hybrid artifact, something that was brought in to manipulate native peoples. Um, but which then became, um, in a sense, creolized by um, the, the Europeans um, themselves. Another object in this uh, collection is this um, piece of red uh, stone here. It's broken, but it's been ground on both sides, has a groove around the edge, and there are um, engravings on the front of it. This is a piece of catlinite stone. Um, catlinite is, uh, comes from uh, Minnesota. It was widely traded um, throughout pre through prehistory and into the, um, his into the um, colonial period, uh, the um, post prehistoric period. Um, and it was widely made into pipes. It is um, commonly found on uh, sites in the Southeast far, far from its origins up at the head of the Mississippi River. This particular piece from Fort Tom Beckby unfortunately was recovered from the back dirt of a looter. So we don't know um, exactly the period of time uh, to which uh, you know, it belongs or who may have used it. But we do know that the French had been smoking the calumet uh, pipe um, with Southeastern peoples since 1699 when Iberville smoked uh, the Calumet pipe offered him by the Bayou Gula people in present day Louisiana. This is a deeply um, ingrained native tradition that the French uh, took to and adopted um, and uh, became also, I think, uh, somewhat of a hybridized type of, um, of, uh, of practice. So when you find a piece of this calumet pipe inside the fort, um, you know, the, we, I think we have to be careful with simplistic um, explanations that, uh, well, there was an Indian inside the fort and, um, you know, hanging out uh, with a calumet pipe. Um, the next object I'd like to, to show you is this, this, this rolled metal piece. Um, this, at first glance, um, could be a tinkler cone. Um, tinkler cones were ornaments that were added to clothing by Native peoples. They are typically made from uh, cut from uh, scrap brass or from, uh, from kettles, trade kettles. Um, and then they're uh, cut into sort of triangles and then rolled and used, um, you know, as uh, to make nice sounds um, <laughs> uh, as, you, as you walk around. Um, this is an interesting example of using a European raw material, but of maintaining a traditional craft. Um, ornamenting clothing and, and gear with um, delicate noisemakers was nothing new um, to Native peoples, but using it in uh, using metal to do it certainly was. The other possibility uh, for this object is that it was a spear point. Um, in some post removal sites in Oklahoma, um, these rolled metal spear points um, are apparently quite common. Um, I'm still on the fence about this one, but I still like to, to, um, to think about this object and to share it with people. 
because it is uh, it's certainly um, a native made piece um, and it's being used, um, uh, made out of uh, European metal. And finally, we have this little potsherd. Um, so what does the rim from a small bowl have to tell us? We can look at this little pot shirt and, and, um, and infer several things. Um, one important thing about it um, is that it was found inside the fort. And it was found inside the fort with thousands of other Choctaw pot shirts. Apart from well-preserved animal bone, the most common artifact found inside the walls of Fort Tom Beckby is Choctaw pottery. The second thing about this pot shirt is that it, it bears a cosmological symbol, the quadripartite division of space representing one dimension or one plane, this world uh, um, in a three-dimensional conception of the cosmos that's shared by so many indigenous peoples is evident on this shirt placed right there very prominently on the shoulder of the vessel. The third thing that's interesting about this little shirt is that it is not Kelowna wear. Um, one type of Kelowna wear is that made by indigenous potters using indigenous tempers and indigenous methods of constructing a pot, um, perhaps of even decorating or painting a pot, but producing it in a um, decidedly European form. Um, this is a pitcher made by an Appalachian potter who was living near the French in Mobile at the early, uh, early part of the 18th century. You can see that it has a foot ring, it has a handle, it has a place there where you can catch your, uh, your finger to help stabilize, um, stabilize the pitcher. It's a, a beautiful example of colonial wear. And our little bowl shirt with its cosmological motif is not colonial wear. Um, colonial wear is common on other uh, colonial sites, I should point out. In fact, our little shirt is really no different um, from any Choctaw pottery found anywhere else in the Choctaw homeland. The ones pictured here are from an 18th century house site located a few miles west of Fort Tom Beckby. Um, this house site um, clearly had ties to Fort Tom Beckby. There were trade beads. There was a uh, there was uh, known to be a, a, a French Jesuit uh, priest living nearby. Um, they knew about the French, and you see no evidence here of influence um, or uh, from from uh, Tom Beckby a few miles to the east. So the Choctaw were adopting European goods, such as guns and cloth and beads, but were also transferring their own traditions to the French in the form of calumet ceremony, deerskin leggings, where you wear your beads. And other adaptations were only hybrid forms of European raw materials fashioned into traditional native crafts. Perhaps the most remarkable um, point of all is the prevalence at Tom Beckby of wholly unaltered indigenous artifacts that were clearly made for the French in um, uh, for the French living in the fort, um, but with no concern for French tastes or traditions or preferences. Again, there's no colonial wear there, even though there was a market. Tom Beckby, um, although it dates late to the period of European colonization, and it dates 200 years after first contact, demonstrates to us that indigenous peoples were very interested in interaction with Europeans, but they hoped to bend that relationship to their own goals, such as kill all the Chickasaws. And they were determined to set their own terms for how to do it. And finally, this is one of my top five favorite artifacts from Fort Tom Beckby. This is a large um, 10, 12 foot granite monument that's set on, uh, on the bluff at the fort. It was set there in 1915 by the Colonial Dames of America, who at the time were setting such monuments around the state to mark these uh, types of historic sites. Um, and so I'm going to um, 
uh, read it to you. On this site stood Fort Tom Beckby, built by Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne, Sieur de Bienville, governor of Louisiana. Here, civilization and savagery met and the wilderness beheld the glory of France. And you can imagine saying that with your best um, fake French accent, a little bit of drama. This is my, one of my favorite artifacts because it's such a lie. <laughs> Um, it's, it's from the Romantic period, we know. It's an, it's an object representing, you know, um, its time. Um, but I think that the more I look at this monument, the more I realize how much of my own work in French colonial archaeology has been influenced by this attitude. We've told the story from the European perspective those maps at the beginning of this presentation about battlefields and European geopolitical boundaries and um, moving um, people in, uh, from place to place across the landscape. Who are you going to make? Um, who are you going to make money off of? Who are you going to use? Who are you going to convince to kill um, their neighbors to um, benefit your own desires? That, that perspective uh, and that, that way of telling the story um, affected the way I thought about these things. And, and I had wonderful, wonderful professors. It's just uh, today um, in the context of decolonization, of flipping that story, it's important to be very conscious of it. I know what better than a 2000 pound granite monument to, to uh, bring home that point um, every day. So we're changing our views. Um, the Choctaw contained the French and the Choctaw then contained the British to a large degree. That's the story here. So in 1763, when the fort changed hands from the French to, to the English, a young lieutenant, British lieutenant, Lieutenant Thomas Ford was there to receive the flag. And he made a record of everything he saw. And he was writing back to his commanders in Mobile. And he said, really, um, it's going to be quite, a, a, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's going to be quite a pain. It is going to be expensive to maintain such a distant and isolated post. But this distant and isolated post was very much the center of the Choctaw world and the Choctaws knew it. And that's the story that we're attempting to tell. And then I hope that I have um, conveyed to you in some way through the presentation of a few artifacts. Um, we continue to learn about uh, Fort Tom Beckby through field schools. It's used as a training site by the University of West Alabama. We welcome students from other places. Um, I currently have four intrepid students working out there this semester, and um, we're continuing um, to uh, sort of flip that script and decolonize the colonial fort. I thank you very much um, for your attention, and I'm happy to entertain your questions. Thank you very much. That was excellent. And I do have a few questions that I've been saving up for you. Okay. Okay, let's see here. So the first one um, is, do we know whether the Choctaws have already suffered, had already suffered from exposure to West, Western diseases and how that might've affected um, their society by the time that the French arrived? Uh, yes, we know um, the, the Choctaws as a unified um, political entity um, really gelled um, in the late um, 17th century. So uh, like many of the larger so-called tribes of the Southeast, they are recent, fairly recent um, phenomenon. Um, and many of those um, um, Organiza political organizations were a result of 
um, um, groups who had been decimated by uh, disease coming together and sort of coalescing as remnant groups um, for strength and for support. Um, the Choctaws continued to suffer um, from European disease. For instance, during the Choctaw Civil War, there was a smallpox epidemic and that um, really um, made it especially difficult for many people. Um, so that was an, an ongoing event um, since the um, basically the middle of the 16th century. Okay, the next question is, um, it's related to artifacts and excavations. They wanted to know if any wells had been discovered or excavated and anything like material remains of wine bottles, clay pipes, weaponry, such as at, such as at Jamestown and later Williamsburg. Uh, yes, we do have, um, we don't have the amount of gun furniture that you might find or expect to find from um, colonial sites. I'm always on the lookout for that sort of thing. Um, we have a couple of musket pieces, some prisons, um, you know, some, a couple of pieces of, uh, of um, we have part of a, um, the, the black powder plate itself. I can't remember what it's called. Musket balls, lead shot. We do have kaolin clay pipes. Um, I don't remember some of the other things, but yes, we do have those objects at the fort. I was having trouble unmuting, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let's see here. The next question is, any objects indicating native adoption of French manufacturing techniques or the reverse? Um, I, hmm. Native adoptions of French manufacturing techniques. Not that I've seen so far. Um, the, you know, grind, um, ground stone calumet pipes is something that Frenchmen did. Um, and so that is, that is something, and in the calumet pipe itself may have been made by a Frenchman. That's a, that's a possibility. Um, but not to, not to any large degree that we've, that we've seen yet. And, and that reminds me, I didn't answer the question about the well. Um, no to the wells. Um, they were on a cliff, but they did have access to the river. And um, there was an artesian spring nearby. I'm still not clear if it was flowing at the time the French were there, but there was also a creek um, nearby. So they had access to water without digging the wells. Okay, the next question is, um, have any whole pottery vessels been found at the fort? And do you know where the Choctaw village near the fort was? Um, so uh, we don't have any whole vessels. Um, the biggest piece I have is probably about a third of a, of a jar. And it's not Choctaw. It's from um, an, an, another um, a group. It's not made at all like a Choctaw vessel. Um, so, you know, it was a very um, heterogeneous place and uh, there were probably Muscogee Creek coming in. There were probably people, um, you know, ethnic Choctaw speaking groups coming up from the coast as well. And that's probably what was brought in. Um, the, I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? Oops, sorry, <laughs> I'm juggling multiple windows. Um, okay. Um, you wanted, they wanted to know where the Choctaw village was near the fort and- uh, Oh, right, had, do we yes. know? Right, okay. Um, there are, um, Choc there is Choctaw pottery um, to the north of the, um, to the north of the fort um, and some to the west of the fort. We haven't located specifically um, that village. It's a pretty big piece of land and we've shovel tested or you know, examined quite a bit of it. Um, I think probably um, we're looking in terms of village, I've been rethinking this. Um, I think we're probably going to be looking at uh, not a sort of nucleated, um, you know, close, uh, close houses. 
um, these people were corn farmers. And so um, I would anticipate village in the sense could have been uh, sort of a widely scattered group of farmsteads um, on the landscape, which would have been a traditional uh, settlement pattern for this region. But yes, we're, we're looking and, um, and um, I know where it's not, and I know where there are artifacts yet. But I think we've been thinking about it in the wrong way. Okay, the next question is any written reference, that, are there any written reference to Choctaw women living and working, baking um, in the fort? Um, this person's uh, comment was the French were known to fully integrate with the indigenous populations, especially the women. And this would have been an alternate explanation mm -hmm. for the bead and pottery in the bakery. Yes, absolutely right. Um, yes, that is a, um, you're absolutely right about that. Um, there is one reference to, um, to there being huts outside the fort in which um, French Marines would have wives and children. And um, we've located the site of two of those. We haven't excavated them, but I know where they are. Um, and I, you know, as far as women being in the fort, I don't know of any reference to that. That has been a question that I've had um, as well. Um, but we do know that the men were going outside and they did have families outside the fort. And this, and this obviously had, you know, something to do with the fact that they're, they were going to, they were going to take the bowls that their wives gave them. <laughs> okay, I'm going to the Q&A because there's questions coming in live now. So <laughs> um, let's see here. Okay. Um, have you made any contact with the Choctaw people in Oklahoma? Um, and it says there, THPO has a PhD in archaeology from the University of New Mexico. Yeah, um, I have um, been in contact with Ian Thompson, and he has uh, he's come to campus um, and he's presented here. He came actually for a commemorative um, event that we had um, about the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek, by which the Choctaw ceded the last of their land east to the Mississippi. And I do know also that Ian and, and other members of the um, Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma have been working in the area in their homeland to document sites. So um, Ian and I have chatted fairly recently and you know, it's going to happen. We're going to have a some sort of collaborative event or effort at the fort. But yes, we are on one another's radar and are in contact. So you have several more questions, but I'm gonna maybe just take maybe two or three because we're a little after six. How do you feel? Do you wanna, do you mind taking a few more? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Great. Um, okay, so the next question is to, um, to what extent do the Choctaw people have oral history of the fort and the changes with the decline of the French occupation? That's a great question. I don't know. Um, I don't know about oral history. Um, that's something that would need to be added to, um, you know, the list of things to, to put with a collaboration with the Choctaw themselves. Um, I think one of the one of the pressing needs um, is certainly to develop that relationship, um, and also with probably another institution. My work at the at the fort, you know, comes from a long history of doing French colonial archaeology on the Gulf South. Um, well, being involved with it, usually following on the coattails of <laughs> those more knowledgeable than me. Um, and I think having, you know, I'm, I'm, I was hired to work at Fort Tom Beckby specifically because the university owns it, um, but it's just me. Um, there's not a big team. So I have to be really careful about how much I take on at the fort and having a partner, um, a long-term partner in addition to the Choctaw is going to be important down the road. Okay, we have a question from Facebook actually. Um, any artifacts that came from the Northern tribes like the Huron? 
not that I have seen, not that I have seen or recognized. The next question, can you say anything about the degree of fraternization between the French soldiers and the Choctaw women? Yeah, I mean, again, we know that they, they had relationships with them. Um, the one re written reference that, um, that I'm thinking of regarding that refers to the Choctaw women as concubines. I don't think that's really accurate. Um, I think that there, that this was a uh, meant to be a derogatory um, comment by by French by the observer, and um, that it's very it's much more likely that they had um, that they had um, unofficial wives. Um, but yeah, the 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 Jesuits were interested in legitimizing those relationships and in bapt baptizing the Metis children who uh, were a product of those relationships. On the other hand, um, I don't want to sugarcoat that. Um, you know, the French could be brutal. Um, there are there were reported rapes of Native women um, by Frenchmen in the area, and um, you know, I, I, I don't want to make it seem like all was harmonious. Um, but but yeah, there is there is evidence there. I think it's one of the more fascinating. Um, potential avenues for research is to look at this from an indigenous woman's perspective. Um, you know, the French, although they didn't particularly prefer corn, um, certainly had to eat it. And, um, you know, it's the women who owned the cornfields, the women who worked the cornfields, and it's the women who were, would have been processing and distributing that corn. So it's really um, from that, um, from that, um, you know, angle very much underwritten by Choctaw women. We've had a couple of questions regarding whether you found evidence of African slaves in this fort. Mm -hmm. um, I have not. I haven't. Um, uh, there are a couple of structures on some of the maps we have that are outside of the um, outside of the palisade walls. And um, that would probably be the place to look. Um, there was also an interpreter's cabin within the uh, walls of the, of the fort. Um, that's a possibility. Um, one thing that these maps do is they kind of give you the false impression that everything was neat and tidy. And it, it simply wasn't. Uh, <laughs> Um, there were there were probably lean tos against the walls or against some other buildings. Um, we know that there were fences attached to the outside of the walls of the palisades between the barricades to um, enclose livestock. Um, and um, and I think that um, the organization of the people, including African slaves, if, if um, and I don't know that they were there for very long. We have that one reference to them. Um, I'm not sure where to look, um, but I haven't seen any direct evidence of it. It's certainly something we, we keep an eye on because Kelowna Ware too um, it has been identified as, as, as a product of, um, of enslaved Africans in the new world. Okay, um, someone asked the question, were Choctaw wearing buttons or only the Europeans wearing the buttons? Um, so coats were sometimes given as gifts to headmen, and those coats would have had buttons. Headmen of the of the Choctaws. As far as buttons as ornaments, um, if that's where the the asker is going, I don't know. It's a good question. So few Choctaw sites have been excavated in the homeland. Well, we still have a lot of questions, but I think I'm going to go ahead and call it. I'm going to go ahead and say it because we could be okay. on here all night long. I'm really sorry for anyone that okay. didn't get to your questions, um, but I will be sending you all the questions um, in a report, Ashley, so you can address them later. We can okay. post them on the website or something like that if we miss something. So, Okay, right. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah.
Well, great. Thank you so much. Thank for you so being much for tonight. attending. Thank you, Ashley. Fantastic lecture. Yeah. Jessica, do yeah, you have any thanks. parting thoughts? Yeah. Well, I just I just want to thank Ashley for, for doing this for us. It, it means a lot. It's important to be able to share the research that's done on these sites with a wider audience. You know, we have a small section in the magazine called Field Notes. And, you know, when there's work being done on our mm -hmm. sites, we'll publish it there. But this way, you know, it's it it reaches a wider audience and it kind of shows why we do what we do. Yeah, so absolutely. Absolutely. And the importance of what the uh, and the importance of what the conservancy facilitates for sure. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you guys so thank much. You thank you, Jessica, for being here. And thank you to everyone okay. who attended tonight. Good night. Have a good night.